I almost threw this jacket away. It hung in my closet for years, just a little bit too big for me, in a colorway that I didn't particularly like, a relic and a leftover from my father, who actually this is probably the only thing of his that I still own. What stopped me from throwing it away was its heft and its weight, which was unlike anything I had ever felt and much different than anything I had in my closet to that point. This overwhelming feeling of quality made it just seem like a waste to just toss it. And this was until about 10 years ago when I started really looking into what Filson is and knowing more about wool and those kind of things. And I'm really glad that I, uh, I wasn't so foolish to toss this thing in the trash. Now it's still a little too big and I don't particularly care for buffalo plaid, but I've begun to wear it on occasion and I even bought one of my own. So in this video, we're gonna look at the history of the Mackinac Cruiser, but more importantly, I wanna show you the way that you can date one if you do buy it secondhand, which I actually do recommend because brand new, they're pretty expensive, but the internet is full of secondhand models, which uh, they, they wear like iron. So you can pick up a used one for much less and uh, you know it's hard to find one that's really damaged. So in this video, we're gonna look at the history and a way to date your own Filson Mackinac Cruiser. During the 1700s, yes, I know, Filson wasn't around back then, but there were trading posts in the Great Lakes region, most notably around the Straits of the Mackinac or Mackinac. It was at these trading posts that frontiersmen would trade goods with the local Native Americans, including dense, warm woolen blankets of red plaid, and this fabric became known as Mackinac cloth. Fast forward to 1811 when Captain Roberts of the British Fort St. Joseph on the St. Mary's River needed coats for his garrison. He had 40 great coats made from the Mackinac cloth that they had at the fort. These coats were so effective that the following year he had more made. Among the men issued these coats was a messenger who asked for his coat to be shortened to make it easier to walk through the deep snow. You know, a great coat is pretty long. This coat would have been the first of the Mackinac cruisers. When Filson finally opened up shop, one of their first products was the Mackinac Coat, which was especially popular among timber cruisers and actually patented by Filson in 1914. Now it's interesting, a timber cruise itself, a timber cruise is a sample measurement of a stand used to estimate the amount of standing timber that the forest contains so that the people who go out to collect these measurements deep in the woods they're known as timber cruisers. Just like the messenger of the previous century, shorter wool coats helped them traverse the deep snow of the Pacific Northwest while still keeping warm. Aside from the length, the rest of the coat is built for work as well with plenty of pockets. The upper left pocket has spaces for writing instruments and a pad. The rear contains a large pocket, ostensibly designed for holding maps. There's even a small compass pocket on some of these models. Plenty of storage for gloves or a hat or your favorite pipe tobacco, all that stuff, add up to this being the ultimate explorer coat of its day. This design has remained relatively unchanged with the exception of some minor details, which can actually help you estimate the date of production of your Filson Mackinac Cruiser. Since this coat has been around for over a hundred years, there's plenty available on the secondhand market as I mentioned. So if you're interested in owning a piece of history, here are a few ways to figure out how old your Filson Mackinac Cruiser is. One of the easiest ways to date a garment is by looking at the tag, and Filson's tags have changed quite a bit over the years. So in the beginning from 1910 to the 1930s, you're gonna find a tag that says CC Filson Manufacturers, and it includes an address. These are the oldest tags around, and they'll include the address of the Filson store, which actually changed several times. So the earlier tags will have the address 1011 First Ave, and then again in 1942, they moved to 1005 First Ave, and then in 1930, they moved to 1001 Second Ave. So you may see any of these, and they're going to be in different order. Now, one thing to remember is that they probably used up some of the old tags that they had. So when they moved, they didn't just throw out all the tags. So they very well have met, been in the second address and used some of the uh, the tags that included the first address and, and all that. But it gives you a good idea of roughly the era that your Filson may be from. From the 1930s to the 1940s, you will find a tag that says Philclo. So, you know, this was a really common way to name things back in the day, and I guess Philclo stood for Filson Clothing. But think about things like FOMOCO or Mopar, and, you know, they like to shorten things that way. And obviously it didn't stick because they did away with it after about 10 years. From the 1940s to the 1960s, you will find the actually pretty familiar union-made diamond tag. And the Filson diamond tag has been around for a long time, up until the 1990s. 
and it usually has some script underneath. And that's actually what will tell you the era that it's from. So from the 1940s and the 1960s, the words below the diamond label said union made. Then from the 1960s until the 1990s, Filson did away with the union made tag and included the might as well have the best tag with a numerical size beside it. Before the sale of Filson in 1981, they had used the tagline might as well have the best and sized their jackets with chest sizes rather than small, medium, large XL sizing. And from the 1990s until today, you'll find the black diamond logo. And this is what you'll find on all modern Filson pieces, along with the typical small, medium, large XL sizing. Now, there are a couple of other things that you can use to date your Filson garment. And that actually has to do with the jacket and the design of it itself. One of the first ones that you can look at are the enamel snaps. I, I love these, they're so cool. They can be found on several different colors, including black, green, and gold, and they were actually provided by the company United Car. These were used from the 1920s through the 1950s when they were replaced with the current black debossed snaps that you find on, on everything nowadays. The offset lower pocket. This has kind of become the stuff of legend, but the front of the Mackinac Cruiser has four equal sized pockets, which are typically positioned right in line with each other, except for a period in the 1940s through the 1950s where the lower left pocket is slightly offset from the upper and it's a little bit smaller. Now, why they chose to do this is a total mystery to me, but it does clue you in at least to a particular era of your Filson. The wool mark tag is found on lots of wool items across the world, and its history could probably warrant its own video, but in the 1990s, Filson licensed the use of the wool mark tag, so it can help pinpoint the approximate date of the red diamond tag garments. The one I have in front of me does have this, so it's safe to assume that this is from some point in the 1990s. Production tags. Okay, now this is going to get a little complicated, so just kind of stick with me here. Inside the inner pocket, but sometimes it's not there, sometimes it's up near the tag, it, you'll find a little tag with the lot number on it. 110 is for the Mackinac Cruiser, lot 83 is for the double Mackinac Cruiser, etc. And there's a whole list of these if you want to look it up, along with a series of digits below it. Now, this is where it gets weird. Throughout the 1990s, the first two digits indicated the year, while the two later digits indicated the month. For example, a garment may have a four-digit code of 9605, which would mean that it was produced on May in 1996. But in the 2000s, Filson just decided to reverse the order so that the first two digits are the month now, and the second two digits are the year, so a garment with 0414 designation would be produced on April of 2014. And it's likely they swapped these things around to make sense after the new millennium, but it does get a little tricky. Now, the jacket itself is a tank and i don't really care which one you get the double mackinac cruiser the long cruiser the regular one like i have here or even their their shirt jack ones which for some reason are almost thicker than these a little strange but either way their mackinac wool is amazing and i have it on good authority that their current mackinac wool is made by pendleton so pendleton woolen mills out on the west coast now, this thing is a tank, and I know that that term gets thrown around a lot. I am very guilty of using that term probably too much, but I can't think of a product that really embodies that more than the Mackinac Cruiser. It's burly, it's tough, it's utilitarian, it's kind of scratchy. I, I guess tanks are probably scratchy, but the thing is just tough as nails. I mean, look at the saturation of this thing. You know, I mean, yes, it did live in my closet for some time, but I remember my father wearing this quite a bit and it really does look almost new. It's, it's just amazing. It's seemingly impervious to wear. So these things are great, especially if you wanna buy something that you could pass down to your son, your daughter, whoever it is. I mean, heck, you can even use it just as a, as a blanket. They're, they're just amazing things. And, you know, wool being wool, it means that it stays warm when it gets wet. It means that they, they, the, the fibers can flex over 20,000 times before they break. It's just a tough, durable jacket that will last a long-ass time. And that could be evidenced by looking at the secondhand market, which, again, is where I recommend getting one unless you really, really have to have, you know, the most current version. And actually, you can find some of these very old ones that I mentioned with the enamel snaps on them and the offset lower pocket and even some of the weird ones that Filson tried, you know, different things with, with different pocket varieties. But be prepared to pay for it because a lot of times you'll pay just as much for a really good vintage piece or more than you will a brand new one. So 
they're out there. You do have to search for them. Um, but if you're into that kind of thing, I mean, what a neat hobby to get into. And really, for you know, when it comes to watch collecting and uh, sports cars, it's pretty inexpensive. So who knows, one day if you buy one of these and put it aside, maybe someday your son or daughter may find it in their closet and say, man, you know what? Maybe the old man wasn't as uncool as I thought he was. And uh, that's not a bad legacy to leave behind. Anyway, guys, I hope you enjoyed this video. Thank you so much for watching. Really do appreciate it. And I'll catch you next time.